anyway, on, on to today's super great speaker, George Biros. So Alex, do you wanna, you wanna introduce him? Yes, great, okay. So I guess we can start uh, our seminar today. So um, welcome to our ML plus X series. Uh, today, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to have George Biros uh, presenting to us. Uh, he's the Moncrief Chair in Simulation-Based Engineering Sciences in the Oden Institute uh, at UT Austin. Uh, and uh, he uh, has been in UT for, uh, for a number of years. Before that, he was uh, uh, at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, and before that, he received his PhD from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, he, and, and even before that, from Aristotle University in, uh, in Greece. So I didn't know that, that he was from, uh, from Aristotle University. Uh, so, uh, he uh, was also a postdoctoral scholar at uh, Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences, and he has done a lot of excellent work in computational science uh, and uh, numerical linear algebra, and he has received the ACM Gordon Bell Prize, uh, which is a very significant award uh, in this space twice, actually, uh, in 2003 and in 2010 with, uh, with collaborators. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have George. Uh, I think he will be telling us about N-body Hessians today. Hi, Alex. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank uh, first uh, Adam, Alex, and Verena for organ uh, organizing this, uh, this talk and for inviting me, giving me the opportunity to present the work. Um, uh, please feel free to interrupt me at any uh, uh, time if you have any question. I don't need to cover everything. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Chao Chen. He's, um, uh, he's a postdoc now in my group. He did his PhD at Stanford. Severin Rees, he's a, a PhD student at the University of, uh, Technical University of Munich. Uh, uh, James Levitt, he's a student here at the Oden Institute and uh, he's working with uh, Gunnar Martison and, and, uh, and myself. And uh, Chen Han uh, Yu that actually graduated uh, and he's now at NVIDIA, uh, but uh, he was instrumental in uh, working on uh, parts of the code and algorithms that I'm gonna be describing. And in case that's, that's a hierarchical matrix, which I'm gonna explain. Okay, so the outline of my talk, I'm gonna uh, discuss the geometry oblivious fast multipole um, and uh, uh, it's uh, essentially a technique to compress uh, uh, arbitrary symmetric positive definite matrices um, if they are compressible uh, and uh, requires point-wise matrix uh, entry sampling. Uh, and then I'm, uh, I'm gonna discuss its um, application to an attempt to approximate the Gauss-Newton Hessian of a fully connected uh, uh, perceptron. And the challenge will be there too that we don't really have point wise if we have an efficient uh, approximation we don't have point wise entries and we have to approximate them so <clears throat> this end body really uh, or fast multiple methods that are underlying this uh, um, structure rank approximations appeared um, let me first actually define the problem uh, essentially it's a dense matrix uh, vector multiplication so we're given endpoints in d dimensions uh, and with every uh, each point, we have associated a weight. And um, we want to compute an output I call here potential, but it's essentially the output of this matrix vector uh, multiply. So uh, G, I, J are the entries of the matrix. Uh, in, uh, in this uh, uh, environment, we don't really have entries, but we have a kernel evaluation. So we're given uh, actually N times D data and uh, have an n square calculation in which the entries can be computed on the fly in principle and then do a, a matrix accumulation. So this is also called sometimes the kernel or gram matrix. Um, and uh, then we, the all to all interaction is when we have endpoints and we want to compute these potentials uh, in, the, in the same locations. So that's the, the n body problem. Uh, and the challenge here is that this is an n square calculation and when n is large, this is an expensive calculation. Um, here I have uh, what's called the Green's function for the Laplacian, but in the context of machine learning, a more typical kernel is the Gaussian, but you can have other kernels uh, that don't even have to be radial basis functions. They can be uh, other, other types of uh, functions. And um, 
uh, initially these problems appeared in computational physics. This, this kernel appears in uh, gravitational interactions, but also electrostatics. And uh, that's where uh, the first methods, that's what's called the n-body problem, appeared in order to accelerate these calculations. So the application- can I, ask, can, I, can I ask you already one kind of basic question? Like in my yeah. world, when, yes. I have a, when I have a kernel function, um, you know, there are these, let's call them just landmark points like XIs. And then I want to evaluate that kernel function on, on the new point X. And so I need to do this summation of K, X, I, X. And um, like I'm used to, so like the XIs are already fixed. And, the, and, the, and, and what you want to do there is to sort of do a sublinear time estimation of what the kernel function is on that point. Is here, it seems like, you know, you're not fixing landmark points or is that problem related? Well, to you can, if you do a lot, a lo uh, it's a, if you do, so this is an exact evaluation, but if I, if I decide that at any, at the, let's say at some point, suppose this is my evaluation point X, right? I can select some landmark points and I'm going to discuss this shortly. And then instead of evaluating all the points and doing an N, I can choose the landmark points and then evaluate at the new point and have a sublinear evaluation. So this is a global low rank. What you're referring to is an Eastern method, which is a global low rank approximation, right. which I'm going to discuss. Okay. Uh, but and I'm going to compare and I'm going to discuss the, the relationship. Great, Does this great. make sense? Yeah. yeah. And George, one more question. Should I be thinking here that the number of points is bigger or the dimension is like, are we in the regime where the dimension is much, much lower than the number of points? So the, uh, these methods, when they started, indeed, D is basically for all physics application is most not all of them but typically is d less or equal to three and right. of course in machine learning that's not the case and there are implications for that and i'm going to discuss that's kind of the, the point of the talk great so in general we don't have any constraints the question is whether the method will work or not yes yeah but the problem is arbitrary and uh in real applications machine learning we would of course d will be fixed and we want to the, have an efficient method as n increases but right. D should be large in general, of course. And any matrix, if I'm not mistaken, can be represented in this way if I make the dimension big enough, right? Any PSD? Let's let's let's. Oh, we'll get into that. <laughs> let's go slowly. Okay. okay. <laughs> no, any, I, don't any, think... I, I was going to say that any PSD matrix would, would have that such a representation, but maybe I'm mistaken. Okay, great. Uh, uh, I mean, there are some theoretical results, but you know, I'm more a numerical analyst, so I want to see actual numbers. Right. So, in, you know, in, in practice, in, th in theory, yes, in practice, no. Okay. <laughs> so, but, uh, okay, so the main application, as I said, what started this business is computational physics, uh, gravity, uh, electrostatic, uh, molecular, computational chemistry, uh, electromagnetics, uh, uh, um, uh, circuit simulation, etc. cetera. Uh, in machine learning, you can have Gaussian processes, you can have non-parametric statistics, uh, kernel methods, uh, diffusion maps, uh, estimation, uh, compression of covariance operators, um, and if possible, generic uh, compression of uh, matrices. In, our, in, in this talk, I'm focusing on symmetric positive definite matrices. And in machine learning, just to give you a Mickey Mouse example, uh, if you're doing, let's say, a, this is not a binary segmentation, let's say you're doing a binary classification in image, you have some features, uh, that will be a log, uh, the log odds probability if you want to do logistic regression, and that will be the the a point, and this will be the weights that you want to train for, and that's the, the linear regression, and then you can turn that into a <clears throat> kernel logistic regression in which then uh, after training uh, to the classification of a point uh, requires this evaluation. Uh, this is for one point, and for one point we have n calculations, and that's what Adam and Alex said that you can have landmark points and try to compress compress this to sublinear. So the computational challenges, and so I'm here. I'm focusing on the all-to-all -all, uh, point, but you can have it for for queries. Uh, let's focus on the all-to-all -all point, which is more relevant for the Hessian calculation. So the <clears throat> computational challenges is we have. Um, Endpoints, so that requires n square work for the matrix vector multiplication, and actually, in many cases, we want the factorization, which uh, which has cubic work. Um, if we were to do that uh, in uh, uh, in the obvious way, uh, compute the matrix and then factorize it. Uh, <clears throat> so there are two uh, ideas we explore. Is of course the the first is sparsity. Uh, this is a n by n matrix, but uh, it's sparse. All of these are zeros, uh, or we can have, and these are 
many cases, many kennels, if, for example, the bandwidth is very narrow, or if the interactions are very local, you can get this parsity, or you can have kennels which are very smooth. Um, and then uh, you can have this matrix that it's dense, but it's a rank one matrix, obviously, and uh, you can have a uh, low rank approximation. Or you can have the situation in which have sparse plus low rank, which is neither sparse nor low rank. And in this case, in many types actually, in many cases, interesting properties have, interesting operators have this structure and then sparse in low rank approximations kind of fail. Uh, but no, notice, and that's kind of the motivation that if you structure and order the metrics appropriately, certain blocks of the matrix are low rank. So essentially the, the theme will be that uh, we have to look at the metrics and uh, instead of doing a global low rank approximation, create a rank structure. And this is uh, many groups are working on similar uh, problems. Um, so the hi hierarchical matrices were one very, the simplest version are uh, a matrices that uh, have this uh, structure. So this is a total met a big matrix that it's, uh, it's uh, uh, originally dense. Uh, and, but then we, we permute it and we organize it. So we have this um, four blocks. We can imagine here this G11, these are the, these big blocks, right? The, uh, I'm talking about the whole, the whole block that will be my G, G11. Um, and uh, then what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna do an approximation for the off diagonal blocks. We're gonna do a low rank, we're gonna compute a low rank approximation somehow. And this is what these, uh, these really, uh, these colors indicate that we, this uh, G, G22 or G12 is really the product of two low rank uh, matrices with some rank. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we do the same and then we recurse. So we have written uh, the, uh, this matrix as a block diagonal matrix plus a low rank, I can combine this, a low rank uh, matrix that captures the low rank of diagonal blocks. And then we can recurse. We can do the same for the sub blocks and continue up to some minimum level. It turns out that if you can, once you do this construction, if you can permute this matrix uh, and uh, construct the low rank approximation sufficiently, once you do that, you can show that uh, an n square calculation, it's trivial, it's uh, n log n, where, where, the, um, where the constant here uh, refers to the rank of the off diagonal blocks. So this is the simplest, perhaps, uh, uh, in my opinion, description of hierarchical matrices. There are many variations and combinations, but that's the basic idea. Uh, and somehow, sometimes, again, these are referred to as rank structure matrices. So the questions, so the important point is, that this is not permuta uh, permutation inver uh, invariant. So if I change the ordering of the metrics, I'm gonna destroy this low rank structure as opposed, let's say, to an SVD or a low rank approximation that you can permute the metrics any way you wanna, uh, you wanna and you're gonna get the same results. So here we have several questions. How do we find this permutation? How do we compute efficiently this off diagonal approximation, this low rank approximations? How can we prove if pro pro possible optimal complexity? error bounds, and then once we have everything that, uh, under control, how do we translate this to a HPC implementation? And let's say for D less or equal to four, uh, and for a, a great um, uh, uh, collection of kernels, these uh, answers have been uh, answered efficiently. Um, and this is just some references uh, that, uh, that uh, refer to low dimensions, let's say D less or equal to four, uh, to four. Uh, and these are uh, kind of uh, pioneering works in H matrices. This is uh, the first attempt from physicists to, um, to introduce uh, these approximations. But the main contributions were by uh, Vladimir Rocklin at Yale and Leslie Gringer at Quran at uh, Flat, Iron, uh, Flat Iron Institute now, uh, in which they really um, developed a very rigorous technology in which they essentially said for a very large class of problems, you can get machine precision accuracy, uh, provably, robustly, in a linear complexity for all to all. So that you can turn the n-square calculation to order n in uh, to machine precision, essentially. Um, and these codes are being uh, used in the industry and there are workhorse um, codes in many, many applications. In high dimensions, the situation is less rosy, of course, because there are, the problem is challenging. Uh, there has been some work on, um, on uh, um, uh, uh, kernels in which you assume you have some points 
or you have a specific kennel, for example, Gaussian, and I have some reference here, including our work, um, uh, or you can have purely algebraic uh, approaches uh, that go beyond. Uh, so these are all three uh, hierarchical metrics. So here I'm leaving low, low rank and the, whole, the huge, the huge, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, uh, body of work in uh, low rank approximations like Nystrom and and uh, and uh, other other uh, other uh, other methods. Um, but uh, there there is a, a group at um, Lawrence Berkeley. There is a group at uh, uh, Eric's group at uh, Eric Darvish group at uh, at Stanford, and of course there is Leshing Ging and, and Gunner here working on these peeling methods in which they they try to construct these approximations. Uh, and here is kind of a, sele a selection of uh, codes that exist, and there is uh, the different uh, variants, uh, whether you have points, uh, whether you have arbitrary uh, metrics entries, uh, how you do these low rank approximations, which I'm not going to discuss in detail, and whether you use trees or other, other methods. I'm going to be discussing uh, this uh, GoFMM method in which uh, the metrics are. Um, we just assume entry, uh, metrics that we can sample uh, any arbitrary story. I'm switching between K and J. These are coming from, from, D, uh, from K and G from different uh, uh, talks, but this is the, the metrics entries. Um, and then this is uh, an algebraic construction of the low rank, um, uh, and, but it does use a tree. Uh, and uh, let me give you an, a, a kind of an idea. So this is um, a, um, uh, a matrix, matrix multiplication. So uh, in which uh, we multiply with the 512 uh, vectors, the matrix is uh, 65 by 65, most of these guys, or 13k uh, uh, or this 8k. So these, these are different, uh, here this in this uh, axis, I have different matrices, the kernel matrices, Hessians, graph uh, uh, matrices, the details don't matter. Um, and, um, uh, and this is the just doing a, a fast, uh, 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 calling a fast blast matrix matrix multiplication in single precision. And uh, this is the time to compress this matrix to, comp to accuracy uh, 1%. Um, and this is the time to compression. So for example, this matrix takes about 10 seconds, but it takes for us one second to compress it and then takes 0.1 second to apply it to a 1% accuracy. Uh, and these are arbitrary matrices. Um, and you can see sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The compression is very expensive. Uh, and if you try to pump up the accuracy more, you might end up being even more expensive. So in general, these methods, um, as, as even a, a low rank, you cannot really prove a priori that the matrix compresses, they can either guarantee accuracy or uh, accuracy, not both. Uh, excuse me, uh, uh, you can either guarantee cost or accuracy, not both. And that's, of course, the case even for low rank approximations, uh, unless you have more information about the metrics. Uh, so constructing the approximation. So uh, George, firstly, some, someone had a question. What was the x-axis on your previous slide? The x-axis are different, uh, the different uh, matrices. So these are different cases. So for uh, example, this is a graph Laplacian matrix that has 13,000 unknowns. And the blue one is the time to do uh, the standard blast calculation. And the green is the construction of the approximation, and the yellow is the evaluation. So these are some standard matrices that the 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 the, the, the area has agreed that we care about those matrices, or are they from some uh, they have some specific structure that you like? Uh, no, the as far as the area is kind of small. <laughs> I mean, there are like four people working on this that okay. I know of, especially in high dimensions. So we haven't. Uh, but these are Gaussian kernel matrices in different dimensions. Oh, there I are see. some inverses, so this is no, there is not standard. There's a few different ways yeah. of collecting them that I see. I see. Yeah, so I think, uh, I'll present some results from COF type and MNIST and CIFAR uh, mm -hmm. data sets, but uh, with different ke Gaussian kernels. But I would say that's the most standard. And there is work, of course, in the Nistrom community, and we can get some of the matrices that appeared in the Nistrom literature for machine learning. Mm -hmm. um, so constructing the approximation. So first, I'm going to try to introduce the basic ideas from a physics point of view. So imagine that um, uh, now we have two separate blocks. So so we have our original metrics. So if I if I wanted to look at the original metrics, really, actually, maybe I shouldn't write here. If I have the original metrics, uh, uh, I have. Um, 
what I'm uh, really looking at is that an off diagonal block, uh, which uh, which uh, these are the, the the targets and these are the sources. Uh, so these are the sources here and these are the targets. So I want to evaluate uh, the gravitation potential, I assume, of all these points to this uh, group of points. Uh, in physics, what people did, uh, you know, if you think that these are galaxies far, far away from each other, uh, in physics, people realize that I don't, for every point here, I don't have to visit every other point. The simple thing is to first replace this uh, set of uh, points with a big point. Like uh, if you think these are stars, you can put a big black hole in the middle. And then with some pre-processing, so there is some averaging here to replace the center of mass and a black hole. And then you do evaluation uh, directly to this uh, calcu uh, calculation. So if I do it uh, in a metrics form, uh, these are our, uh, the targets. So this is what we want to evaluate. So this XI corresponds to this, uh, uh, if I put I here. These are our sources. These are uh, um, the targets that are the sources, XJ. And this is a dense metrics. But what we're going to uh, uh, replace this matrix is with a, a column in which, instead of having all the sources, this is my representative point, right? The, what you say, the um, uh, Adam, I just have one point, which is this uh, the center Land, of mass. Landmark, yeah. Yeah, the landmark, excuse me, thank you. The landmark, and then this is an average operator here. So, but uh, which is just compute the average and there's a scaling. So, this is essentially a rank one approximation. That's actually the first 10 body codes, that's how they the, the produced. But you can make it more accurate. For example, a simple method is to put, instead of having one black hole, you can put more black holes, or you can do other expansions. You can do Taylor expansions, uh, Fourier expansions, et cetera. You can do analytic approximation, but essentially compute a lower rank approximation. Uh, and here, the important thing is that in this methods and body, you don't do an SVD, right? Uh, this is impossible in real applications, too expensive. So you do other methods, uh, in, uh, to construct the low rank approximation, which again, I'm not gonna discuss now in too much detail, but you can do uh, expansions analytic or a combination of expansions and algebra or purely algebraic in which you try to sample and then you go to metric sampling uh, ideas like Nistrom, leverage scores, etc. The other idea is that if you want to control the accuracy, the points are not always well separated. So if I want to compute the potential at the point here, although I can approximate some of the far interactions, near interactions are not possible to approximate in good accuracy. So I will have to split the interactions to near interactions, which are computed exactly, and far interactions, which are computed uh, approximately. And this is the near diagonal, off diagonal. Um, and, and here, implicitly, there is a, the notion of a permutation in this idea. And um, finally, there's a recursion in which given the points, this is how we compute the uh, permutation, we can do some kind of clustering ideas. So this will be the, uh, the points in which I will compute the n-square interactions, splitting it into two groups, let's say left and right, oops, uh, to, to left and right, will create uh, a uh, two by two uh, approximation, left, right, uh, right, left, right, right. Uh, and then if I continue, I can create Two domains, and then I can uh, 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 this point partitioning introduces a permutation in the matrix, and then I can start looking at individual blocks and decide whether appro approximated or not. Okay, so we have the low rank approximation standard Nyström. We have some things that have to uh, be done exactly and cannot be approximated, and then we have this uh, recursion uh, partitioning of the of the operators. Okay, and these are typically uh, used in points using points and distances. The permutation can be done using some type of clustering. The near far decomposition can be done by sampling points. Um, and uh, this is what's called the landmark points and compression. Can be, you can think as doing Nistrom approximation of individual blocks uh, uh, recursively. There's a way to, to, to build Nistrom approximations for smaller blocks, but I'm not gonna be discussing this uh, in this presentation. So that is the general ideas. Any, any questions here in the general flow of the algorithm? Okay. So the geometry of uh, oblivious FMM idea is to permute the matrix to expose low, uh, low rank structure. Uh, but all the algorithms that have appeared, or most of them appear on, um, on uh, 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 distance between indices uh, Xi and Xj. So really what we have is we have this uh, Xi and Xj 
and we have to kind of organize this calculation. Is it exact? Is it uh, approximate? And the, the, the decision is based on the distance between some distance matrix between xj and X, uh, xi and xj. But we don't have that now, right? So we have this criteria for some points i, j, and we're gonna, uh, uh, we're gonna be doing for SPD matrix, we're gonna use the distance as a, uh, i, j as the function of the entries of the matrix, g, i, i, g, i, j, and g, j, j. Uh, and these are standard gram vectors in SPD in which we assume that uh, the entries i, j are given by an inner product of some unknown features. This can be infinite dimensional functions. Um, and uh, then we, we can use distances between these two points. And then the Euclidean distance turns out if you expand the sum can be written as a function of the matrix entries. So the distance between uh, i and j is just this matrix evaluation. So you have to evaluate the diagonals and then sample this entry i, j or evaluate this entry i, j. And then angle condition is something similar. So now, basically, given a specific matrix, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the matrix entries and use that structure in order to permute the matrix and expose a lower rank structure. Um, whether that's ideal or not, we don't really have a proof. We we have applied the method to method to matrices that we have points and works quite well. So once we have this notion of uh, of um, of uh, of um, distance between indices, we can uh, use a standard trick core kind of clustering. The way you cluster points, you use distances like k-means. We don't use k-means here, we use some other methods, but you can think it's something like that. In k-means, you use distances and kernel k-means, in fact, use the same kind of idea in order to, um, to, 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 to apply this, uh, this clustering. Uh, and so we use random linear algebra to compress the matrices. We use these parallel binary trees to construct the permutations. In our algorithms, we use nearest neighbors for sampling and uh, approximation for the near. Uh, and nearest neighbors is an issue because these are large high dimensions. So you use, um, so we use it for pruning and sampling and you use a randomized nearest neighbors. Uh, and then we built an infrastructure and we have a several uh, uh, publications here, but uh, we have uh, taken inspiration for, for several related work. Um, so let me give you now the, uh, some first, uh, some kind of results of nearest neighbors. So the, the, the first thing we need in order to construct the algorithms, we need to compute nearest neighbors. I didn't explain quite why we need that, but I'll uh, 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 describe, uh, I mean, the, the, what we needed is the near far decomposition. So near requires nearest neighbors. Um, so what we use is uh, here, I just have a sketch of the algorithms, are randomized trees. This is really work of um, projection, random projection trees. Uh, by uh, uh, Dasgupta and Freund, in, uh, and they have several follow-up work. But the idea is that you create random uh, binary partitioning of space, and then given a point you want to find its nearest uh, neighbors, you do a greedy search. You insert the point on a leaf, and you look only for nearest neighbors in that leaf. Then you create another random tree. This point ends up in another leaf, and then you, you merge the nearest neighbors between these guys. So it's a greedy calculation in which every time you create a random leaf, and then you do this search. Um, the theory is really favors more locality sensitive hashing, but we found this is a much more robust and efficient and scalable method in practice. Uh, these are some examples in which uh, you see Avazu. These are high dimensional tests. So these are sparse data sets. This is Avazu, this is the KDT12. These criteria, these are clicks and whatever they are in, uh, from uh, URL websites, but these are points with 4 million unknowns, 40, 45 million. Uh, this is a dense. Uh, and they go from the dimension is 1 million to 54 million. So the, uh, the KDT 12, every point is in a, uh, uh, we have 150 million points and every point is in 54 uh, million dimensions. Of course, these are very sparse points and most of the entries, the, the, the number of non-zero entries is order one. So most of these dimensions are zero. So these are sparse data set, but these are nearest neighbors from five to 64. Um, and uh, here this, is how many trees we need uh, uh, to get 64 neighbors to get some convergence. So here, in for example, for KDD12, we use 153 of these random trees. And at every uh, tree, the number of points per leaf is about 10,000. So if you do 153 times uh, 10,000, uh, 10, that's about a million. But notice that the whole, so we, to find the nearest neighbor, you need a million evaluations. But notice that the whole data points is 149 million. So you sublinear basically you can find 
uh, nearest neighbors and this 95% um, uh, recall accuracy. And of course, this is uh, possible because the ambient, the intrinsic dimension of this data set, it's much, much smaller. It is not a global intrinsic dimension, it's local, right? That's the assumption as opposed to doing, let's say some kind of global or approximation, but there are local intrinsic dimensions that allow these uh, nearest neighbors. Uh, and this is a scalability result in which we did a 2.2 terabyte uh, synthetic data set, 1 billion points in uh, uh, 512 ambient dimensions, that's a Gaussian in uh, 13 uh, uh, or 20 dimensions, I think, uh, on about um, uh, 20, uh, 28,000 cores. It takes um, about 73 seconds to compute the 89 accuracy. So we can, you know, we can uh, pro process and find this near far decomposition of the data set. Um, you know, terabyte terasets in seconds. Now, of course, if you give me a Gaussian in a thousand dimensions, it's not going to work, right? If the ambient dimension is uh, a thousand Gaussian, this the, there will be no recall accuracy. You have to do n square calculation. But practical data sets, of course, they have this uh, locally and and this uh, um, dimension. Okay, so that's the near far decomposition. The second component, which is very important, is this block lower rank decomposition. So now what we've done, we've, um, we've, uh, we have computed our orderings and we have some kind of block that we want to compress. We've decided after permutation that this particular block in our matrix can be, can be compressed. And in general, this dimension here will be N. So this will be all the points. So here, what, we, what, we, what this matrix uh, corresponds to is ima imagine these are my set of points. I have some sources here, these are my XJs, and I'm trying to compress the effect of all these points everywhere else, okay? So that's uh, X lives here. These are all the remaining points. Um, and uh, and uh, I'm trying to compress this block matrix, okay? Um, if, I, if I want to see the matrix view, you can put it here. This is my big matrix I've permuted, and I'm trying to compress a block something like that. So, of course, we can do an SVD, but we have to do this for multiple blocks, and that's out of question. We can use sampling either with leverage or norm or range based, based using randomized uh, approaches, but randomized approaches require that we touch every entry, and that's again out of question. We're not allowed, the moment we touch all the entries of the matrix, once we're done. Um, so, we cannot, there's no, these matrices don't have a fast math vector because that's what we're trying to construct. So what we're doing essentially, we have to, we are forced to do a kind of a sampling using sampling rows really and interpolate in the composition. So we want to find the representative points. So the landmarks, so I want to find landmarks for this block. These landmarks really correspond to, I should have used green. So these are our landmarks, sorry. These are our landmarks and correspond to specific columns of this matrix. How do I find these columns using an interpolative decomposition? Um, but in order to construct this interpolative uh, decomposition, I would have to do a, basically a pivoted QR of this whole matrix, which I'm not allowed. So I'm forced to sample uh, uh, rows. Um, and uh, so we, we do some row sampling, which is essentially, we have to sample some of the points here, sample some of the targets in order to construct then to do an interpolative deposition. So what we do in GoFMM is a mixture of nearest neighbors so we find the nearest neighbors of all these points and you use them to sample, which is kind of morally equivalent to, uh, to norm, um, but not exactly, to norm-based uh, uh, sampling, plus, uh, plus uh, uniform, plus adaptive. So we do it in an adaptive way with some tar uh, target accuracy. So there are several components and that's kind of the, perhaps the, the most uh, sensitive part of the algorithm. F visually to explain what we do, imagine that we have this, um, this tree and we want to uh, approximate this uh, the, the effect. We want to find basically the landmarks for these points. These are the original points and I have to find landmarks for this particular subset. First we do the, we find the nearest neighbors. Okay, so this involves a randomized uh, nearest neighbor approximation. Then we, uh, we find the nearest neighbors and we augment them with some random sampling from the remaining data set. So now we have basically uh, a, a matrix which uh, involves this uh, source, these sources and these targets. We do interpretive decomposition, we select a, a landmarks using these points. Okay, so that's how we constructed 
So we sampled some uh, points and then we constructed the, the, we found the three landmarks that we have here. Does this make sense? Okay. I thought there was some, you know, quasi recent work on, you know, very efficient Nystrom sampling that, you know, if, if the rank of the matrix is very low, then I can get like a, I just need to do something proportional only to the, to the, like the intrinsic rank. Like if it has an eigenvalue decay or something, then I, I can do a very sparse column subset selection to come up with a PSD matrix approximation. Is that not right or not useful here? Or? There is some work that was also at, Prin at Princeton and from Stanford that they do, especially you some sample of the matrix and then uh, the, the idea is that you given the big, oops, sorry, given the matrix, you subsample uh, and you use this subsample matrix to compute leverage scores. And then you sample from a, a bigger matrix. Again, you approximate leverage scores and you move up. But if you work out the complexity, the constants are astronomical. Oh, okay. And uh, I mean, theoretically, yes. In practice, no. Okay. So we implement it, it's very slow. Got, gotcha. Yeah. But indeed, there is this kind of telescopic sample the metrics to approximate the leverage course and then keep going up. Uh, so this is Sidford from Stanford. And I mean, that's the one I know. I don't know if there is. Uh... I'm thinking of some work by like um, Musco, Cameron Musco. I'm trying to look it up. Uh... If you know, same because there's so I'll, much I'll, 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 I'll send it to you. Popping out that it's Whoops. hard to follow, but yeah. please do send it. Yeah. Um, because we don't have good theory and we use essentially uniform sampling estimates, which are very pessimistic. Okay. Uh, but then during the evaluation, and I'm running really uh, late, during the evaluation, if I have a, a, a point, uh, as opposed to lo local, uh, global low rank that you will have some global landmarks, you find you, the query point, you find its nearest neighbors that we, you do exact, uh, but then you traverse a tree and you go for every leaf and you have to decide whether this leaf can be approximated or not. Uh, and the criteria we use is whether this point has nearest neighbors that touch this leaf. If the nearest neighbors of this point do not touch this leaf, then I can use the landmarks or the skeletons, what we call, and then you go hierarchically. So you, you visit parts of the tree using the skeletons and eventually uh, this leaf, for example, has a nearest neighbor and we we'll do an exact evaluation. So that's kind of the, the idea in, um, whether you have points or, or, or go FMM. And that's the hierarchical metrics. It uses, uh, there is a hierarchy in what you build the, uh, the, the, the skeletons of this big leaf. You compose them from the skeletons of the, its children, but that's irrelevant. So how many samples and how do you, how do you sample? A uniform sample theory typically uh, says that uh, if I want to approximate the global low rank with the metrics, uh, this depends really on the or the, uh, if I want to do a R uh, rank approximation uh, and I do uniform um, uh, row sampling, what I described uh, before, you get an uh, error that uh, has, depends on the problem size of the matrix and has the, uh, the, the, the sampling. The L is the number of rows that we sample. And L, in order for this estimate to be valid, it has to be greater than uh, the coherence of uh, G and uh, M is the, the n by m metrics and then this is the accuracy so these are standard results uh, that we've uh, adjusted a little bit for the for our for our method but they are known results um and this is uniform sampling I, in um the the, the in the in uh, in uh, go fmm and ask it uh the, the main idea is that we're going to have a similar estimate but the 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 rank that appears here is the off diagonal rank that's the main thing. And the hope is the off-diagonal rank decays much faster, or the hope, the hypothesis is that the decays much faster than the full rank, because you can still have the full rank matrix and approximate it. So if that's the case, then you can apply this method. Um, so then we have estimates uh, that have the, the complexity um, uh, as a matrix of storage, evaluation, uh, and uh, uh, and then the error, and here there is a log that has to do the depth of the tree and this off diagonal block, uh, which we compare with the uh, low rank and this, we have a paper for that. So uh, that's kind of the, the idea. And then we have estimates for parallel. If you wanna do this in parallel, you can have estimates that involve the dimension of the point, the number of nearest neighbors, this S rank, the, the off diagonal rank, the, the depth of the tree and the points per, per processor, but Again, all the, all the constants here appeal, uh, are, are natural. So just to give you a, a, a sense, this is a Gaussian. 
And the, the numbers are, uh, that you see really are very sensitive to the bandwidth. So here we've chosen a bandwidth which is very hard to approximate. We played with bandwidths. So that's the bandwidth that it's hardest to approximate uh, low rank or uh, sparse or, or, or dense. So this is not easy metrics to approximate. And this is the target accuracy. And here that these are old results, so don't, for, forget the timing. This is percentage of kernel evaluations. So if I was, I was doing a direct evaluation, that will be 100% uh, for one point. So uh, if essentially, uh, Adam, in, in your language, I'm using 2.1% 2 2 of N as landmarks. Okay. So if I want to get, you know, 10 digits of uh, nine digits of accuracy, I need 2.1% of my uh, my set. If I want to do three digits, I can use 0.2% of my set as landmarks to get this accuracy. Um, if I want to move to a point, a data set point now that has 64 D dimensions and the intrinsic dimension is 20 dimensional, same number of points, you can see that if I want to take a near single precision accuracy, I almost need all the kernels. There's no compression, right? using this method. And I don't know which method can, can compress these metrics. Now, if I, I'm, I'm willing to go to down to um, three or orders of uh, two, uh, two orders of magnitude, two digits, I can use only 1.6% and do some linear evaluation using this organization. And we, are, we, we apply to some standard uh, data set that appear in the, uh, appear in the Nistrom com community, the COF type. This is the dimension of the data set. Um, uh, this is a uniform distribution in 64 dimensions, um, which is much easier than the Gaussian for some reason. Um, uh, SUSY, which is hard uh, to uh, uh, one. Uh, these are high energy physics data sets. And this is uh, MRI, uh, Gabor features of MRI um, in 246 dimensions. And you can see, you know, most of them that compress well, these are huge data sets, very large dimensions. You get uh, 1% uh, accuracy for most of them. This guy, it doesn't compress. So that's a real data set in which it's natural dimension. The, the input is only 28, but you get 10% accuracy and you're already at 11% evaluation. And it, it just doesn't compress. Uh, I'm gonna, we compare against Nistrom and, uh, and ask it and you can find bandwidths in which just to have low rank. So I'm gonna skip this. We have a KDD paper in which we try to do this in learning and uh, we did some study in the COF type in which we saw that the bandwidth is very sensitive and you can get, you know, for the COF type, you can get 95% accuracy in standard regression, binary, uh, uh, me, binary classification. And Nistrom uh, with rank 60,000 just cannot get the accuracy. And in this regime, uh, the, the hierarchical method is twice faster than uh, Nistrom and gets uh, almost 7% more accuracy. You can find a lot of examples that does, that's, that's not the case. Nistrom performs well, just to give you at least an existence uh, result. So I'm going to skip these guys. This is for other software. I'm going to skip that. And I'm going to go to summary so I can give it perhaps a few minutes on the Hessians. So it's a, it's a method that approximate um, generic SPD metrics. It can, um, we have open source code. Uh, the complexity really to factorize it is n uh, s square, which is s is the, the rank of the off diagonal blocks. Uh, we can guarantee complexity, either <laughs> complexity or accuracy, not both. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's the case for all metrics approximation schemes. Uh, and uh, we have several parameters, annoying parameters with respect to the trin construction, the sampling, oversampling, and adaptivity. So it's a little bit finicky. And that's another shortcoming. Okay, so here we apply GoFMM on a multi-layer perceptron and Gauss-Newton Hessian. So we want to apply, apply um, the Gauss uh, and the Gauss-Newton Hessian uh, and try to compress it. Uh, Gauss-Newton Hessian uh, GoFMM requires entries of H I uh, H I J, but as you as uh, you know, everybody is using metrics free essentially. Uh, backpropagation. So these uh, entries are not available. We cannot apply the method. So what we want to do is uh, we want to approximate these entries now. So it's going to be a double approximation. Not only we approximate the metrics, but also we approximate its entries somehow in order to make this calculation. Sorry, George, uh, I missed that. Why don't we have access to the Hessian? You'll see. Oh, okay. We, we, okay. we don't have, a, if I give you, if I give you a, a network with a hundred million uh, parameters, uh, you don't have order one. So, so let me say, 
you know, we would like order one <laughs> access to these oh, guys. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, okay, I can I, I can it. have okay. access to order. Sure. A large, so the, uh, yeah, uh, it's the order one. I that, see. I see. I got gotcha. you. Breaks it. Uh, and um, and we want to try to explore the MLP structure, and we have a paper that appeared recently in CIMAX. Okay, why second uh, why Hessians? There is attempt. There are attempts to improve it uh, for training, and actually, I should have put Omar's. Uh, actually, have Omar here. Um, Omar's paper that uh, have a very nice in which you say New Newton show Newton's method can really accelerate at least for auto encoders. Um, Okay, you can use it for robust adversari uh, adversarial uh, training. There's a lot of work from uh, Mahoney, Golami, uh, uh, a Berkeley group in quantization and pruning in which you need the spectral information of the Hessian to decide uh, pruning. And they have uh, results on real data sets like for CIFAR and ImageNet that can prune 70% or more using Hessian information um, and, uh, and other applications. Um, so let's go to the MLP. Um, what do I want to say here? So uh, multi-layer perceptron, we have uh, se several, so um, <laughs> what do I do? Uh, let me see. Okay, so what do I need from don't, here? Don't worry, don't, don't worry so much about the time, George. I okay. mean, you know, just, okay. just do what you need to do. Do what you think is best. <laughs> uh, right, uh, I hate when I see talks. Now I'm not gonna turn off the Zoom channel at uh, <laughs> four o'clock. <laughs> um, okay, so what do we have here? D is the dimension of the input. So uh, in this simple example, D will be the, the input data set has dimension D, but all the layers have dimension D, okay? So it's a really imagine a layer in which all the layers have just to simplify the analysis. The analysis doesn't require that, but just to simplify the idea what D, D is. But essentially we have the input and then we go, we apply the layers, the dense metrics at every, at every layer, then we take the activation function and we propagate. So that's the forward propagation. Okay, it's a, a series of uh, layers, and here it's just a simple layer. You can easily we have actually ResNets um, or residual connections, but that doesn't change anything. Um, and then W is going to be the concatenation of all the unknowns at every layers, and, and then we have the objective function capital F, in which has a loss function i, and little n will be the number of points in our data set. Okay, uh, so that's the um, the the uh, the project the excuse me the 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 setup. So then, given these points, we're trying to minimize this objective function in order to find these uh, weights, which is the concatenation of this uh, of this uh, uh, of of this vector. So the important numbers is d, which is both the input but also the the dimension of every layer, and the number of weights, big n the number of weights, and little n the number of points in our data set. The Hessian, of course, will be uh, n by n, big n by uh, n, uh, and it's typically going to be dense. Uh, and we, for many applications, we need an approximate uh, factorization, either for a Newton step, if we want to do that, and it's necessary, or for post-processing MOS, for example, quantization and pruning. Um, <clears throat> we use the Gauss-Newton just because we require something that uh, is SPD, but uh, if the Newton Hessian at a specific point is SPD, then one can apply this to Newton Hessian. The algorithm, however, has to change. And here we discuss only the Gauss Newton. Uh, J is the Jacobian, so it's the derivative of the output layer. So XIL is the output of the i point, the final layer. And then we take the derivative with all of the weights. So that's a dimension of matrix of size D by N. And uh, then the whole Jacobian is just the sum over the points of these Jacobians, and QI is just the 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 Hessian of the uh, loss function, and that's the setup. So we want to approximate this matrix. This matrix is uh, symmetric positive definite. Um, its rank is uh, less than the minimum of n and d over n. So if we have very little dimension and very few points, it's going to be a low rank. But in many applications, d and n are quite large. So and this will be larger than n. Uh, so it's unclear whether this will be low rank or not. Now, the way we solve it in a matrix free, if I want to apply a matrix free, if I just wanted to, excuse me, if I just want to apply the Hessian, uh, this will be the gradient. And so you propagate the network, you store your activation functions, 
uh, then you compute what we call in our language adjoints. I don't know what is called this in this is the back propagation step. I have no idea what is called this in machine learning, but these are we call these the adjoint variables in uh, differential equations. Uh, <clears throat> and then you accumulate the, the gradient. Um, and uh, that's the gradient evaluation. And actually, the Gauss Newton Hessian has exactly the same form. The only difference is that there's a linearization step here. So you have to take uh, some derivatives of the activation function. And you have this MI term, which is diagonal scaling uh, that uh, has to be pre computed. This is the point wise derivative of the act activation function. Then there is the uh, Newton Hessian, and then the, the, the remaining is pretty much the same. So the metric vector multiplication with the Gauss Newton, uh, Newton Hessian has exactly the same cost as uh, the gradient, and you can apply the Hessian to a vector, right? So this is the metric uh, vector multiplication in complex that really have to. Uh, visit all the points and for every point uh, propagate them through the weight, through the network. So that will be little n times big n. Uh, so how can we approximate this session with, uh, with other uh, methods? So the matrix free is what I described here. You can just take the diagonal, which I'm not going to discuss anymore. Uh, you can use a randomized SVD. So this is the work that Halko, uh, Joel, and, and Gunner have uh, pioneered. And uh, if the Hessian has low rank, you have a nice uh, efficient matrix vector multiplication here, and you can apply it to, um, to construct uh, this uh, uh, low rank approximation, but that requires a global low rank approximation. You can use what's called this K factorization by Martens. It's a machine learning uh, community. It's essentially a block diagonal form, but with an additional approximation. Um, that's not provable. You cannot all uh, this method. This is accurate. This is proven. You can you know you can increase the cost and you can make it convergent. This is convergent. This is convergent. This is not convergent. Uh, <clears throat> so then the construction cost for all these methods. The matrix free does no, has no construction really. The storage is the number of uh, weights times the number of points divided by the layers. Uh, RSVD. Uh, there is some uh, matrix vector multiplication, but then essentially you have n times r, and the solve. We're interested also in the solve. Is n, uh, 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 n times r? Uh, if you do matrix free, the solve will be n times uh, the number of weights times the number of points times square root of k, the condition number. Uh, k factorization. It's very popular, and we discussed in the paper, but I'm not going to discuss it here. And then the hierarchical matrix has to do with uh, sampling the entries, factorizing the matrix, and then uh, the storage, unfortunately, is more than uh, the matrix free. So there is a factor of D that it's missing here. So it's most exp more expensive for the storage, but then has a guarantee both application and solve. So depending on these parameters, the solves can be much, much faster than, than the original matrix vector multiplication. So that's kind of the, the win, big win situ uh, situation. And that's kind of the, the, the problem here because we, you know, we have a lot of memory requirements. Uh, I'm running out of time, but the ideas are, are let me go uh, over the ideas. Uh, so in order to compute the Hessian, you really, if you if you look at this guy, you uh, and you expand, you need to access columns of the Jacobian. And the columns of the Jacobian is essentially the derivatives of every um, point uh, with respect to every layer. Um, Computing that is very expensive. So what we do is we do certain pre-computation, which I don't have to explain, that requires, which is independent of points or independent of the Hessian calculation, excuse me. We have to pre-compute certain quantity with, that has cost um, uh, n times n times d. But then we do essentially bad sampling uh, to compute these inner products for the Hessian. So it's a combination of pre-computation and then sampling like the same way you do batching to calculate these entries. Eventually, once we do the pre-computation, every entry of KM can be computed at D times some constant. The constant is controlled by the accuracy. So we have a sampling that controls the, uh, the error. So this is really a D over uh, epsilon square work per layer. And D is the average dimension of every layer. And so that's the calculation to compute every entry because remember, GoFMM, uh, requires these entries. So there is a pre-computation phase that has nothing to do with the Hessian. And then you do almost order one to do the sampling. OK. So we apply this to certain networks. Uh, let me, so we do low and high accuracy. This is classifiers, and these are autoencoders. This is MNIST, this is CIFAR. These are 
uh, uh, dense layers. These are not like uh, wider nets or whatever you have. These are simple two, three layer um, uh, uh, networks. Um, uh, for example, this autoencoder is uh, for CIFAR, it goes from 372 to 10 to back to 372. And this goes from 372 to 20 to 3072, excuse me. Uh, so, and you have 126,000 unknowns in the weights, and the points are, you know, 50,000, uh, 50, 55,000 points are the, for CIFAR 10. Uh, and this is the accuracy that we get as a percentage again of the kernel evaluations. We can get uh, three digits or four digits accuracy. Um, using a, a small percentage of kernel evaluations. And this is how much time it takes to construct and evaluate the, 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 the method. So this is a high accurate evaluation. If I compare the different uh, approximations, so this is autoencoders, this is MNIST, and these are CIFAR, two CIFAR uh, networks. This is more expensive. So this is 126K. And it's about 64k uh, weights. And uh, you can see the accuracy, uh, hierarchical metrics. You get 1% of uh, sublinear time again. Uh, you get, uh, uh, for this MNIST, you get 17%. If you try to pop up the accuracy to four digits, you need 11%. Uh, low rank approximation with uh, SVD, you get uh, similar accuracy in high rank but you get similar cost actually, a little bit less accurate. So I don't see huge differences in this case. You know, if I, these are the key columns, the high accuracy and the, the low accuracy, I don't see really, I mean, we're a little bit more accurate, but given all the buhaha here, it's not worth the pain. Uh, and KFAC is kind of, doesn't really work. And then this is a larger CIFAR 10, in which uh, here we have in a case in which there is a big difference, uh, same cost, but the low rank gets 20%, whereas here we get uh, high accuracy evaluation. Um, so, so that's the uh, an example of the Hessian. And these are at the solution we, we, we get, you know, we, we solve an autoencoder problem. Uh, and George, uh, George, can yes. I ask a question? Yes, of course. Can you trade off, um, can you go with something low accuracy, but then just use it as a preconditioner in a Quilov solve? Like, you of don't... course, yeah. I mean, that, that's, I mean, depends really what you want to do. So I, I, I don't discuss what is the accuracy that you need, mm -hmm. right, in the task. So I don't, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe this is completely, I don't really have a case. If your question is, can you show me a case that this really matters? I don't have a case. <laughs> okay. So I don't, you know, we didn't use it for classification or compression or preconditioning at all. We just, we mm -hmm. just applied to see if it compresses. Yeah. And if you look at the low accuracy, even in the low accuracy, actually, in this example, so mm -hmm. let's say the, the low accuracy, which we drew just point, uh, point thirty two percent is now, and we already get ten percent, you know, the one hundred percent error. So you cannot get any accuracy here from a low rank, but you get three digits of accuracy. Mm -hmm. So you know, yeah, now whether this this case is important in machine learning, I don't know, but this is an example of a network in which it's not compressible. Classifiers compress all the classifiers we tried. If you try to do regression. They compress very nice. All of them are low rank, mm -hmm. really, unless you initialize them at random weights. If you try with random weights, they're full rank. But the moment you take a few epochs, that's done. It's down to low rank. Uh, it's kind of interesting to understand. But that's a classifier with uh, a low rank, and it's a, a large classifier, uh, one sixth million. And if you want to form the Gauss Newton, it will be 10 terabytes, but we can compress it in about um, 420, uh, still a lot of memory. But uh, we get, uh, you know, 2% uh, accuracy using just a point. But as you said, you don't know how this affects like actual classification errors. Yeah, like. and these are really Mickey Mouse. These are dense networks. So this is, you know, we we'll go through 372 to 512 to 256. I right. mean, nobody is going to good uh, mind that will use such a network to, class to, to do classification because there's no convolutions here. There are no nothing. These are really yeah. simple uh, networks. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up here. So um, the, uh, the Newton Hessian is actually more informative and more interesting to uh, uh, apply, but it's not SPD and we, are, we, we want to think how to apply there. Um, uh, once you have convolutional networks that the D, the dimension of the layer is huge, you know, we don't have this, what we suggest doesn't really apply. Um, and then we also have the GoFMM limitations, but that's kind of our, to our, to our um, 
knowledge as kind of the first attempt, other than Martin's work in machine learning to kind of approximate these Hessian operators. All right, guys, sorry I ran a little bit over. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take uh, as many questions as you want. Thanks, everyone's virtually clapping for you, George. That was a great talk. Um, for, for those of you who have stuck around, you know, uh, any, any, any questions? Um, take a question or two, might as well. We're over time anyway. In the chat, where's the chat? What's preventing you from uh, doing ImageNet? <laughs> We cannot run the network in the complexity. We have this D here. Uh, this pre-computation requires that the, the width of the layers is small. So D in uh, ImageNet can be millions. So right. that I doesn't, see. yeah, we, we don't, I don't know how to do that uh, ImageNet. I mean, we can do ImageNet with a, with, a, with a Mickey Mouse network. That shouldn't be a problem, but. Um, it's probably not takes, a network that people would use, yeah. Yeah. The the classifier network, the on the quarter actually we took for, uh, from one of uh, uh, Michael Jordan's papers. So it's not a completely ridiculous network for the autoencoder uh, when they were studying Hessian. Uh, and, and that's that's the one we can compress. But you know, even that as an autoencoder, that's not really a state of the art, you know, as opposed to other methods. Nobody really uses this type of networks, you know, in, in practice. I see. So, what's the main stumbling block here? I mean, you know, I mean, what's the future direction to be able to handle, you know, more interesting networks? The future direction is you have to go and compress more stuff in the individual layers. You have to be able to um, deal with convolutional networks. I think you have to combine it with one of uh, Garner's method on randomized sampling. You have to extend it to. I mean, basically, this is another ten years of work that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Right. By then, well, yeah. by by then, like you know, a lot of CNNs are already sort of subsumed by transformers. So by then, you'll be onto a different. Yeah, for the, actually, transformers is something really nice because it's a dense uh, metrics that you cannot. It's not low rank, and actually, we're talking of Amir of trying to apply this on transformers. I see. Um, but you know, there, there's a lot of, you know, we we need a lot of people. You know, you need uh, an army of people to start this to to work. You know, George, um, to get back to this point about accuracy, it, it may be worth looking into the, the notion. I mean, it doesn't, you don't have to have a good approximation in order for it to be a good preconditional, right? As, lo as long as it, you know, results in the precondition matrix is, you know, gives you a, a, a spectra, you know, clustered eigenvalues, and that's going to be good for Krylov method. So it could be that you could trade off and have very low accuracy or, you know, a reasonable accuracy, but still get a really good preconditioner. And in the end, you know, I mean, modulo the non-convexity and the local minima issue, which is a whole can of worms, you're still going to converge to the same, the same thing in the end. Um, and so you might have like a, a dials. In your, but, you know, I wonder as a general principle, um, you know, there's, it, it seems like architecture versus solvers and algorithms are completely decoupled, but, you know, shouldn't they be really integrated? And, you know, you, you should be designing architectures that not only give you good, um, you know, good approximation properties, but also give you lead to good algorithms. It, th those are seem to be coupled questions, coupled issues, and um, they're divorced yeah. from each other right now. So I mean, like, I, I, these fancy architectures, but then it takes you know three months of GPU time to train them. So, I mean, there's so much research to be done in architectures, and the, that the the machine learning community, I think doesn't really want to wait and think how we're going to solve it. You know, they use PyTorch or whatever it is. I mean, there are people who are working on it, but the emphasis is trying to solve harder and harder problems, I think. And that's mm -hmm. that's a valid, I mean, that's the right thing uh, to do. It's, you know, more impact in trying to find architectures. And then there are some people uh, that, are, you know, on Facebook and other locations that are trying to look at the algorithms. But the networks change so much and there's so much, um, you know, so much going on there that it's hard to 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 step back. Yeah, I mean, I mean there's there's huge inertia to just you know yeah. find the next best architecture. I mean, when intention layers came out, it was a big deal and and, and continues to be a big deal. Um, you know, un until someone someone's large team is able to to figure out the next best thing. So, 
Uh, says, Gunnar says that the matrices that George needs to sample are SPD. Uh, oh yeah, that was from a, a previous comment where yeah. I had mentioned these, um, these methods of, of uh, I think Christopher and Cameron must go about this, these recursive uh, Nystrom sampling methods. And they do require that the, that the starting matrix is, P, is PSD, as you guys say, SPD. Yeah, we also have this constraint, uh, but the samples are not, when we sample, actually the, the blocks are not, they're not, they're rectangular. Uh, but these are lower, these are standard low rank, you know, in principle we could apply, you know, that's an idea in which you can apply, you can apply the, um, uh, uh, you know, if you have a fast mat vec for that block, a block you should be, the method you should be using is really Gunner's method uh, that uh, uh, will expose the correct uh, ID. And fortunately, uh, you know, just sampling the entrances or for to define what is near or far and to identify the block is very expensive, let's say for convolutional networks. Oh yeah, and George, one more thing. Were these batched? The, the Hessians were were based on all all D. Yeah, all D. No, but I mean you can combine these with batch and have small n, yeah. and you can play all types of tricks and do only batch Hessian, etc. And if it's batched, then it's gonna be low rank. That's why I have this, you know, I have this um, this estimate here that you know, if if you're looking at uh, a small batch, then this can be a really small uh, matrix. As a low rank matrix, depending on the on the layers, uh, but here we just did the whole thing. The batching is on evaluating the entry, so essentially you can think that uh, in order to compute the entry, we use batching. But it's you know with a control error and the theory it's much clearer cleaner because it's a now this is a linearized problem. Mm -hmm. uh, probably some from theory they can do really better. We can get better estimates here, but uh, you know essentially it's a Monte Carlo estimate. All right. Well, thanks again, George. Um, okay, guys. I thought you find something interesting there. <laughs> uh, oh, definitely, definitely. But uh, you know, there's something beyond low rank approximation, and something that combines everything. But um, you know, there's still stuff to be uh, to be done. And you know, in the real applications, low rank seems to be working quite well. Well, um, thanks, thanks again, George. We, Thank we'll, you for we'll, having uh, me. Hope to see you guys in, in, in two weeks for Michael Purchase talk.